most of the Buddha's discourses deal with may call it high or deep spiritual matters, nature of existence, how to end suffering, and so on. And most of them, the majority, were delivered to bhikkhus. A number of discourses delivered to lay audiences, and a few of them deal with what we might call life advice, more mundane sort of topics dealing with daily life and how to live sensibly and well. One in particular I want to talk about this evening is the uh, Sagala Sutta in the Digha Nikaya, which has sometimes been called the layman's vinya. And it's a very specific sort of um, advice to this layperson. The sutta begins with the Buddha going for his uh, his alms round in Rajagaha, the capital of Kingdom of Magadha, and passing through the uh, squirrel's feeding place or the squirrel sanctuary in the bamboo grove. It's a royal forest or royal uh, park open to the public. And there's a story why it was called the... Um, the squirrel's sanctuary, a previous king went into the park with his retinue of dancing girls and musicians and fell asleep under a tree. And his retinue wandered off to pick flowers, leaving him alone. And while he was sleeping, a black snake, poisonous snake, crawled out from a hollow in the tree and began to crawl towards him. And a day while living in the tree saw this and assumed the form of a squirrel and hopped down out of the tree and made chittering noises by his ear to wake him up. And he was saved from the snake. He saw the snake in time and got away. And he ordered that in perpetuity the squirrels are to be fed in this in this place. So they put out a feeding station for squirrels. So kind of funny that you know it wasn't even actually a squirrel that saved him it was a dewa so squirrels have been uh, freeloading for you know 2500 years <laughs> <laughs> anyway that's just a little amusing anecdote the buddha as he passed through the park he saw this lay person sigalaka dressed in white which is generally in, in uh, Indian traditions is what uh, lay people wear when they're doing religious ceremonies, is a white robe. And he was doing a, a ceremony where he made obeisance to the six directions, the four compass directions and above and below. And the Buddha watched him for a while and he asked him, what are you doing that for? And he said, this is a practice passed down from my father that I should frequently make obeisance to the six directions. And the Buddha said, that's very good, but I'll teach you how to make obeisance to the six directions as we do it in the Aryan discipline, you know, the, in the noble, the noble way of the Buddha. This is a, an example of one of the teaching techniques of the Buddha in that he would take cultural forms from the society and reinterpret them, put a twist on them that would have a deeper meaning. And he interpreted the six directions in terms of human relationships and how to conduct them. But first he gave some other teachings. He said, first you must abandon the four defilements of action and not do evil from the four causes and not follow the six ways of wasting one substance. Avoiding these 14 evil ways, you will cover all six directions and become a conqueror of both worlds. You will in, enjoy your existence in this world and you will have a good rebirth in the world to come. Then he went on to explain that the four defilements of action to be abandoned are taking what is not given, sexual misconduct, lying speech, the taking of life. So these are the first four of the five precepts. Not uh, not taking life, not taking that which is not given or stealing, 
not committing sexual misconduct, which is basically adultery, and um, not telling untruths. And the four causes of evil to be avoided, all evil action springs from attachment, ill will, folly, or fear. This particular uh, list comes up in other places as well. It's uh, advised that for making a decision, that your decision should, you should examine your mind when you make a decision and make sure you, it, you're not coming from attachment or greed. You're not coming from ill will or anger. You're not coming from delusion or confusion, or his, as he translates it here, folly or fear. Yeah. It's in the, the Vinaya when um, an officer of the Sangha is chosen, uh, be someone like the store's monk or the secretary, or someone who's got like a official position in the monastery, you're supposed to not appoint someone who you think would act from those one of those four causes. So I think that's a really important teaching. Examine the motives for your actions, and uh, when you're making a decision whether to do something or or not, or choice between two paths, to make sure you're you're not coming from from uh, attachment, uh, ill will, folly, or fear. Now, if you act on any of those impulses, it's going to go wrong. And the six ways of wasting one's substance. Addiction to strong drink and sloth-producing drugs is one way of wasting one's substance. Haunting the streets at unfitting times is another. Attending fairs is another. Being addicted to gambling is another. Keeping bad companies is another, and habitual idleness is the last. And he goes on to detail these somewhat. There are six dangers attached to uh, addiction to strong drink and sloth-producing drugs. Present waste of money, increased quarreling, liability to sickness, loss of good name, indecent exposure of one's person, and weakening of the intellect. Now, I think uh, everyone can relate to these as symptoms of, uh, of drunkenness and, and substance abuse. Uh, it's, it's not so much basic things in human life have changed in, in, you know, in, the, in the time. Like this is advice you could, you could give today with, without changing anything. There are six dangers attached to haunting the street at unfitting times. One is defenseless and without protection, and so are one's wife and children, and so is one's property. One is suspected of crimes, and false reports are pinned on one, and one encounters all sorts of unpleasantness. So wandering the streets late at night. I mean, this is the kind of things that happen. And there are six dangers attached to frequenting fairs. One is always thinking, where is their dancing? Where is their singing? Where are they playing the music? Where are they reciting? Where is their hand clapping? Where are the drums? I think the main meaning here is you know, wasting time with frivolity. There are six dangers attached to gambling. The winner makes enemies, the loser bewails his loss. One wastes one's present wealth. One's word is not trusted in the assembly. One is despised by one's friends and companions. One is not in demand for marriage because a gambler cannot afford to maintain a wife. The winner makes enemies and the loser bewails his loss. It reminds me of uh, when I was in the working world, I, so I worked with this one guy who every time we had a payday, he wanted to play a paycheck poker. You take the serial numbers from your paycheck and make a poker hand out of them. And whoever gets the uh, 
the best hand to get both paychecks. And, and I never wanted to do this foolishness. And uh, he said, yeah, but what if you win? And I said, yeah, what if I won? Then I'd have a lot of money for two weeks, and you'd be moaning and groaning, and you'd, and you'd be borrowing money off me, and then I'd have to bug you to get paid back. <laughs> Not worth it. Uh, there are six dangers attached to keeping bad company. Any gambler, any glutton, any drunkard, any cheat, any trickster, any bully is his friend and companion. And the Buddha often talked about in different contexts the importance of uh, the company you keep. That uh, people tend to influence each other more than uh, more than we're aware of, perhaps that. Um, if you if you associate with wise people, moral people, then it's going to encourage you in wise and moral behavior. But if you associate with scoundrels and drunkards and you know, all kinds of uh, low lifes, then you know it's going to drag you down, no matter how you try and maintain your your uh, space. In the Visuddhimagga, where the text is talking about developing the different uh, enlightenment factors, and there's like different things you do to develop each enlightenment factor, and at the end of each one, it's, it says you know, to associate with people that have that factor. Like, if you want to develop faith, hang around faithful people. If you want to develop energy, hang around energetic people, and so on. There are six dangers attached to idleness, thinking it's too cold one does not work. Thinking it's too hot, one does not work. Thinking it's too early, one does not work. Thinking it's too late, one does not work. Thinking I'm hungry, one does not work. Thinking I'm full, one does not work. (laughs) I think we've all known people like that. Basically the same thing is repeated in verse. Then the Buddha says there are four types who can be seen as foes in friendly guys, or the false friends. The one who is who is all take, the great talker, the flatterer, and the fellow spendthrift. The man who is all take can be seen as a false friend for four reasons. He takes everything. He wants a lot for little. What he does, he does out of fear. And he seeks his own ends. The great talker can be seen as a false friend for four reasons. He talks of favors in the past and the future. He mouths empty phrases of goodwill. And when something needs to be done in the present, he pleads inability due to some disaster. And the commentary gives the example as disaster is if you want to borrow his cart, he'll say, I just lost the wheel. (laughs) I got a flat tire, I can't give you a ride. The flatterer can be seen as a false friend for four reasons. He assents to bad actions. He dissents from good actions. He praises you to your face and he disparages you behind your back. The fellow spendthrift can be seen as a false friend for four reasons. He is a companion when when you indulge in drink, when you haunt the streets at unfitting times, when you frequent fairs, and when you indulge in gambling. Then he talks about the true friends, the good friends, There are four types seen to be loyal friends. The one who is a helper. The one who is the same in happy and unhappy times. The one who points out what is good for you. And the one who is sympathetic. The helpful friend can be seen to be loyal in four ways. He looks after you when you are inattentive. He looks after your possessions when you are inattentive. He is a refuge when you are afraid. And when some business is to be done, he lets you have twice what you ask for. The commentary gives the example of uh, when you're inattentive. It says, as for example, when you're drunk. (laughs) (laughs) The friend who is the same in happy and unhappy times can be seen as loyal in four ways. He tells you his secrets. He guards your secrets. He does not let you down in misfortune. And he would even sacrifice his life for you. The friend who points out what is good for you can be seen to be a loyal friend in four ways. He keeps you from wrongdoing, he supports you in doing good, and he informs you of what you did not know and points out the path to heaven. The sympathetic friend can be seen to be a loyal friend in four ways. He does not rejoice at your misfortune. 
He rejoices at your good fortune. He stops others who speak against you. And he commends others who speak in praise of you. Then there's a section of verse. And in one stanza of this verse, this is a kind of an interesting satellite. The Buddha gives his investment advice. He says, you should take your wealth and divide it in four. One part you may enjoy at will. Two parts should be put to work. And the fourth part should be set aside as a reserve in times of need. So if you're following the Buddha's advice, you would keep, uh, you don't live off a quarter of your income, put a quarter into safe investment, savings bonds or in the bank, and half of it you'd uh, put into your business or invest in uh, a high yield, risky investments. I don't know what that says about the economy of Magadha in the 5th century BC. Probably it was a lot cheaper to live, for one thing. <laughs> the core of this sutta is, is what comes next. Is the Buddha talks about uh, the six directions. He gets now finally to the six directions and defines them in terms of human relationships. And this is a, I find this really interesting, both from um, the point of view of uh, actual kind of practical advice and also as a reflection of um, society in, in uh, ancient India. And in, in many ways, uh, that period, um, in that particular culture, has a lot of similarities to our own. It was a period of rapid change, and part of the driving force of the change was uh, new technologies in um, the communications field, which always shakes up society. Like writing and coined money were relatively new in India at the time. They were making an impact on society. And whenever, historically, whenever there's the new communication technologies, things get shaken up. You know? The invention of printing in the 17th century, and obviously now with uh, uh, electronic communication, and it's also a, a period of um, prosperity and relative prosperity and um, freedom and uh, cultural uh, uh, flourishing. Okay, so to get into the text, how does the Aryan disciple protect the six directions? These six things are to be guarded as the six directions. Now this is from... The point of view of this lay person, right? So it's a lay man of one of the higher castes, and he's looking out from his vantage point in six directions. The east denotes mother and father, the south denotes teachers, the west denotes wife and children, the north denotes friends and companions, the nadir denotes servants, workers, and helpers. The zenith denotes ascetics and brahmins. Then he goes through them one by one. There are five ways in which a son should minister to his mother and father as the eastern direction. He should think, having been supported by them, I will support them. I will perform their duties for them. I will keep up the family tradition. I will be worthy of my heritage. And after my parents' death, I will distribute gifts on their behalf. And there are five ways in which the parents, so ministered to by their son as the eastern direction, will reciprocate. They will restrain him from evil, support him in doing good, teach him some skill, find him a suitable wife, and in due time hand over his inheritance to him. In this way, the eastern direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. So the first thing to notice, and this goes through the all six directions, is that the duties are reciprocal. The human relationships are defined as these uh, set of mutual exchanges. The parents has duty toward the children, and the children has duty towards the parents. And if they both perform their duties, then everything is smooth and, and harmonious. 
There are five ways in which a pupil should minister to the teacher as the southern direction. By rising to greet him, by waiting on him, by being attentive, by serving him, by mastering the skills he teaches. There are five ways in which the teacher thus maintained by their pupils as the southern direction will reciprocate. They will give thorough instruction. They will make sure they have grasped what they have duly grasped. Give them a thorough grounding in all skills. Recommend them to their friends and colleagues. Provide them with security in all direction. In this way, the southern direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. There are five ways in which a husband should minister to his wife as the western direction, by honoring her, by not disparaging her, by not being unfaithful to her, by giving authority to her, and by providing her with adornments. And there are five ways in which a wife, thus ministered by her husband as the western direction, will reciprocate, by properly organizing her work, by being kind to the servants, by not being unfaithful, by protecting stores, and by being skillful and diligent in all she has to do. In this way, the western direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. There are five ways in which a man should minister to his friends and companions as the northern direction. By gifts, by kindly words, by looking after their welfare, by treating them like himself, and by keeping his word. And there are five ways in which his friends and companions, thus ministered to in the northern direction, will reciprocate. By looking after him when he is inattentive, by looking after his property when he is inattentive, by being a refuge when he is afraid, by not deserting him when he is in trouble, and showing concern for his children. In this way, the northern direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. There are five ways in which a master should minister to his servants and workpeople as the nadir, by arranging their work according to their strength, by supplying them with food and wages, by looking after them when they are ill, by sharing special delicacies with them, and by letting them off work at the right time. And there are five ways in which servants and workpeople thus ministered to by their master as the nadir will reciprocate. They will get up before him, go to bed after him, take only what they are given, do their work properly, and be bearers of his praise and good repute. In this way the nadir is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. There are five ways in which a man should minister to ascetics and brahmins as the zenith. By kindness and bodily deed, speech and thought, by keeping open house for them, by supplying their bodily needs. And the ascetics and brahmins thus ministered by him as the zenith will reciprocate in six ways. They will restrain him from evil, encourage him to do good, be benevolently compassionate towards him, teach him what he has not heard, clarify what he has heard, and point out to him the way to heaven. In this way the zenith is covered and is at peace and free from fear. And at the end of the sutta, Sagalaka said to the Lord, Excellent, Reverend Gotama, excellent. It is as if someone were to set up what has been knocked down, or to point out the way to one who has gotten lost, or to bring an oil lamp into a dark place, so that those with eyes could see what was there. Just so, the Reverend Gotama has expounded the Dhamma in various ways. May the Reverend Gotama accept me as a lay follower from this day forth as long as life shall last. So taking all together those um, six directions, those mutual relationships, it covers just about every aspect of a, of a human life. Any individual has relationships radiating out from them. You have uh, you know, uh, family relationships and um, work relationships and companions and friends. And everybody's at the center of their own constellation. And if it's seen as in this way, as in terms of fulfilling mutual obligations, then this this makes for a, a harmonious way of living. 
we can see from the way these relations are, are depicted in this sutta that the society in ancient India was somewhat more formal and hierarchic than our own, which is the way the society function if, if all the people are doing their part properly, fulfilling their various duties, then it all runs very smoothly. And it could be that we've lost something in moving towards a, a, a looser kind of social arrangements, that there's there's often not this sense of mutual mutual obligation. We see a lot of antagonistic relationships in modern times that are not so evident in in this picture. And I think although the, the society was highly structured and organized and, and hierarchical in many ways, at least in this sutta, it's not depicted in this ideal form. It's, it's not exploitative. No one is being taken advantage of. They're just Everybody's got their uh, mutually reciprocal duties, obligations to help each other in different ways. So this is one of a very few suttas that are you know, very specifically dealing with ordinary day-to-day -day life situations. This is probably the most specific. And uh, as I said, it's interesting. For, uh, I find it particularly interesting in these two ways, that it's generally good. The, the principles, if um, maybe some of the details are not directly mappable to modern times, but the general principles are, are still quite sound, and it's really kind of surprising how much of it is actually directly applicable. And the uh, second interesting aspect is as a historical document of a um, somewhat idealized version uh, a presentation of society as it existed in the 6th century before uh, BC in um, uh, northern India.